empathy, right? So a data scientist will have is somebody who solves a problem or comes up with a solution for a customer, right? And being able to empathize is a clear sign of emotional intelligence and being able to, you know, put yourself at the, you know, customer's shoes to fully understand what they're going through. This is how you can relate. So once you're able to, or in their shoes, you can express a clear message that elaborate how you will solve the problem. So long story short, empathy. Start with empathy. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Artists of Data Science podcast, the only self-development podcast for data scientists. You're going to learn from and be inspired by the people, ideas, and conversations that will encourage creativity and innovation in yourself so that you can do the same for others. I also host Open Office Hours. You can register to attend by going to bitly.com forward slash a D S O H. I look forward to seeing you all there. Let's ride this beat out into another awesome episode. And don't forget to subscribe to the show and leave a five star review. Our guest today is an Amazon private brands program manager and content creator. He's earned a bachelor's in industrial engineering and a master's in engineering management, both from the University of Florida. As the head of private brands global expansion at Amazon, he uses tech and data science to scale new product development globally. So please help me in welcoming our guest today, a man who if given a chance to do it all over, would have become a sci-fi scriptwriter, Greg Coquillo. Greg, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be on the show today, man. I appreciate having you here. Perfect. I, I could not be uh, more honored by your invite and i um, happy to, to talk to you and anybody else listening uh, to, to your great podcast. So thank you for having me. Oh man, the pleasure is all mine, my friend. I'm super excited to chat with you. So let's learn a little bit about Greg before we get into all of your really interesting and unique experience that that you've acquired over the years. So talk to us about an experience that helped to contribute in shaping you into who you are today. So I, I, I could go to, you know, my, 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 my life story, right? I uh, grew up in a family of entrepreneurs, uh, but they're also highly educated. My mom has a double major, double in engineering. She's a, she's a chemical and a civil engineer. Uh, my father is an economist, uh, but my, uh, they're both entrepreneurs. And I grew up uh, looking at, or they help us, me and my two brothers, looking at the world as if, what, what if we could, right? So what if we could, meaning uh, take a look at a problem and think about what could be done to address those problems. And I've seen my father, my mom put businesses together and those businesses helped us uh, get an education. So we, we, all three of us, we have a, a, a master's degree uh, and, and, you know, uh, this is because of the sweat of, of, of our parents. Of course, we, we did the work, uh, but you know, if I can take a look at the, the, the world today, uh, it's because of the way uh, they educated us to always look at the world as if you are able to contribute uh, and solve a problem to help humanity uh, live a better life. That's beautiful, man. It's such an empowering mindset to have growing up. So when you were in high school, what did you, imagine the future would look like for you so uh you know coming from haiti it's it's a very hard terrain to navigate for a parent right to be able to provide the best education for their kids uh so i i thought i was going to stay in haiti for an education but i was blessed to have uh you know parents who are able to uh 
afford, uh, uh, you know, universities uh, overseas for us. So they, we all went to the United States. We paid international fees. We have no student uh, 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 loans. So I, I actually thought that my life would be, oh, I'm going to get a degree in Haiti and then do work for Haiti. But uh, having parents who are able to provide us with a better education by sending us to a country with a better educational system, uh, now I, I am where I am now. Um, and, and I'm very grateful for that. Is that completely like you mentioned? It, it sounds really different than what you imagined life would be. So, did, so I mean, like if you think about the the world how it is now, right? Like when we were in high school, we we're probably the same age. Like Amazon, like you know, it, it didn't exist back then, right? And and yeah, exactly, and, <laughs> exactly. And, so <laughs> yeah, like this type of global economy, this type of online economy. Like, what did you think you would be doing in terms of work? So for me in high school, I really thought that it was more of a, I knew I wanted to be an industry engineer. So when it comes to factory, for example, I was fascinated by the fact that you could see a tennis shoe, a pair of tennis shoes replicated 10 times, 100 times, 10,000 times, right? And, and with very uh, uh, little variation inside of that, in, in that tennis shoes. So I really thought, okay, I'm going to be an engineer like my mom. Uh, I'm just going to focus on that. But, you know, the outside world, yes, I knew about it. There's a huge influence of the United States over, you know, Haiti culture. But, you know, the terms of me, seeing me working for a company like Amazon, out of the blue, man, it was more of a, you know, I'm going to be part of a factory in uh, helping, you know, uh, uh, with the factory metrics, productivity and things like that. But uh, never have I seen myself uh, in a tech company. So what what was the journey like after you had graduated, after you'd gone through school? Uh, kind of walk us through um, the, the path that kind of led you to where you currently are. Yeah, and, and, and to tell you the truth, nothing planned, right? So uh, I wasn't a, you know, looking at it today, I can say two things. Uh, yeah, there are things that I could have done better to accelerate my career, but also the route that I took was uh, what it was supposed to be that got me here today. So I was blessed to you know, graduate and uh, um, as an international student, as you know today, the things that international students are going through, you know that was tough. And I, as an international student, I graduated in 2008, uh, uh, 2009 actually for my bachelor's uh, right in at the at that depression in uh, you know continue with my master's to graduate with my master's in 2010 so uh, I was blessed enough to have a company you know uh, take a chance with me and hire me because I had a uh, work permit so I was blessed there and started in industry engineering as a process ma- uh, engineer uh, in factories and then uh, with Publix manufacturing and then um, I went to a company called Avery Denison that sell labels in, uh, on different substrates. You can think about like a bottle of beer, pharmaceutical bottle, you name it, or clothing industry. And uh, there I had the opportunity to grow. And this is where I was more uh, uh, grateful. So I had a rotational uh, leadership development program where I, had, I was part of different positions. So I had a chance to uh, explore supply chain, uh, explore quality engineering, uh, safety engineering. I explored uh, operations management and things like that. So those are the things that helped me grow and uh, really uh, uh, cement uh, my 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 uh, technical and uh, managerial skills and business skills. So uh, and then after that, I moved to another company, uh, um, a microbial control company, uh, where I was a product manager. And there, I was really cementing my business skills where I was focusing on pricing management, pricing analytics, margin management, and uh, really the full global product management uh, uh, gig. And uh, this is how I was able to sell my story to Amazon because while I was there as a product manager, I had an opportunity to build a service that really helped people around me uh, making their lives better. So in other words, uh, where I was, I was supporting commercial teams. So sales teams, it took them forever to create quotes. It took them about, you know, two weeks. So me looking at data, I said, okay, why can't you access data a little bit faster? I started creating creating data products 
that made their lives easier. So now, you know, I increased the company's productivity and I was able to uh, uh, work some wonders there. And Amazon was fascinated by that. And, and here I am. That's awesome, man. And was a lot of this was obviously like self-taught. You kind of had to teach yourself the tools, I'm assuming. What, what was that Absolutely. like? Absolutely. And, and this is where, for me, uh, I always say that you'll always hear me say that is to let your curiosity be your driver. Right. So uh, for me, I, the, the world of Tableau, data analytics, you know, it, it was kind of exploding. And I saw that this company had a contract with Microsoft's tools, including Power BI. So I'm like, OK, I want this. I want that. I started taking classes and paying for them myself and started to learn it and build tools for myself. And, uh, you know, looking at a commercial uh, person, somebody in sales, um, looking at their process and doing it myself and then creating a better process for myself using these analytical tools like Power BI. And then it started to click. And then I gathered these stakeholders and I say, hey, this is what I built. Can you try it? And, uh, you know, started asking questions because they are the, you know, subject matter experts and they were able to, you know, adopt my tools. And it became a tool that was now used for bigger things where now uh, they started using it for, um, you know, sales and operational plans for next year. Uh, they're using it to uh, explore price variance uh, when it comes to different uh, uh, currency exchange rates because my tool had more than 49 uh, currencies across the globe. Uh, we spoke to the different uh, marketplaces where we did business in. So it, w it became a tool that had access to all sorts of uh, tables and the, at the back end and created that uh, quick analysis for quick insights and so they can take quick actions. So uh, uh, all of this is just curiosity, that's it. What's up, artists? I would love to hear from you. Feel free to send me an email to the artists of data science at gmail.com. Let me know what you love about the show. Let me know what you don't love about the show. And let me know what you would like to see in the future. I absolutely would love to hear from you. I've also got open office hours that I will be hosting, and you can register by going to bitly com forward slash a d s o h i look forward to hearing from you all and i look forward to seeing you in the office hours let's get back to the episode that's awesome man like you've got a really interesting and unique set of experiences insight and understanding that you've been able to accumulate throughout your career and as someone who is walking in both the worlds of data science and product management, I wanted to pick your brain on the relationship between data scientists and product managers. Um, this is something that a lot of my mentees, as, as well as myself, um, are, are really interested in and would be awesome to hear um, the perspective of somebody who's, who's kind of been there before. So what role does the product manager play on a data science team? Yeah. So, so, uh, uh, long story short, man, I, I can say that, um, the product manager is the team member inside of a data science team, uh, it has to start, you know, to work together. They each, you know, fill their own functions. But, uh, I think a product manager is a member of a data science team. However, uh, you know, it depends on how you, in the company culture see uh, a data science team. Uh, does that company see the data science team as a team who tackles projects or produce products, right? So if that data science team produces a platform that puts out products, therefore that product manager is there to take a look at the product's vision. Take a look at the vision, take a look at what the customers need, able to translate that customer's need into a business need and the data scientists take that business need transform it into a technical uh, requirement so uh, really it's about uh, building that pipeline of customer needs as a product manager taking a look at what that you know long-term vision is for those data science products 
right? So, and, and I say products versus project because it's different. A project is kind of like presenting a business case and say, how do we fix this? And how do we sustain it? But a product has a, you know, life cycle, right? You create it, you deploy it, and uh, you do business with it. You create value for your business uh, for years. And you think about, you know, the time where you will uh, finally deprecate it, right? It's a whole ecosystem. So uh, a product manager is there to guide through the vision. Thank you so much for that, man. That's, you know, very, very eloquently put. I don't think I've ever heard it put so clearly, the difference between a product and a project. That was really good. Thank you for that. So what part of the data science life cycle does the product manager own? Is is it kind of like they're they're throughout the whole process or is there like a particular piece where they kind of put their stamp? It's like to, to, throughout the whole process, right? So when you come, when you think about uh, a product, you're adding different features to that product. So uh, what's guiding those feature enablement or feature add additions is the product manager staying so close to the uh, customer. So in other words, throughout the project or the implementation of that product or development of that product, the product manager is the voice of the customer, period. That's it. So uh, when it comes to taking a pause for, of what's out there, uh, he's the voice of the customer. When it comes to uh, measuring whether the customer is happy with a new feature that you released, that product manager is there to tell you, pull some metrics and validate that this feature is in fact uh, uh, doing its job or this feature needs some uh, improvement and would go to the data science team to take a look at, explore different ways to uh, increase uh, the customer experience. Thank you very much for that, man. So th there's a question that somebody asked me during one of my office hours and I was kind of stumped at, 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 the, uh, at the question because I, I don't think I had a good response for it. So I'm, I'm here to ask you. So hopefully you could help me in my thinking here. So how is a product manager different from a manager of a data science team? That's, that's, that's a good question, right? Um, so if you think about a data science product, uh, at conception, uh, you always start with a business problem where both the data science manager and the product manager is part of. But the data science manager is there to look at the big picture in terms of how do we solve that product, that problem, that business problem. First of all, translate it from a business problem to a technical problem. But now what kind of team do I need, right? Do I need, is it a new, a new problem? Do I need research scientists? who are now experts in crunching data to analyze, simulate, estimate, you know, come up with a new, uh, 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 you know, model to explore, you know, uh, uh, that set of data that speaks to the particular problem, right? So the data science manager is the one who's bringing all the team together that he or she feel is needed to uh, orchestrate the solution to that particular problem, not the product manager. The product manager is more customer facing, remains there and feeds that data science manager with everything for that data science manager to make the optimal uh, decision for that optimal team uh, 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 for me. Right on, man. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So what can the data scientist to learn from the product manager? I, I'm, I'm, I'm going for a, a, a huge uh, kudos to uh, data science managers because in, 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 a, in a very developed team, you will see that they are already uh, business savvy people, uh, right? Because they have access to the data, they can kind of self-train, right? Uh, a good thing to do is probably, you know, take more, uh, you know, become more aware about the financial terms of a business metric, right? A business performance. Uh, so they can work with financial teams, just like a product manager works with the financial teams. Um, they can work a little bit more with uh, the legal team, 
because the legal team is another set of, of, of things that you definitely need to, to understand, especially for businesses who are, uh, uh, you know, international. So uh, the regulatory landscape, the legal landscape changes, and they should be more aware of, of these and how these legal landscape affect business and affect business performance. So it's two things. So the product manager can teach them kind of like a, the financial side of it and also uh, kind of like the legal side of, of business. That could be a very good, good, good thing. So for the data scientists out there um, who are knee deep in just doing the code and doing the algorithms and stuff like that, what could they do to develop their business acumen and maybe develop their product sense? I believe in the power of shadowing, right? So you have multiple people in the business, on the business side who are willing to help. It depends on the organization too, right? Uh, so uh, to, to me is, you know, let's say, let's say, you know, I want to be a, be a data science scientist and uh, I want to uh, pick a project to me, one of the things that I have to practice is, you know, uh, communication skills. It's, it's huge, right? And um, that communication skill helps me translate that technical solution into a business solution that you can relate, uh, uh, that you can have your stakeholder relate to. So, um, and, and the, one of the best ways to learn from stakeholders is to invite them into the technical solution, uh, uh, you know, building building session. So um, I, I think that, that, that's how I see it. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Power of shadowing, man. Like just, just I, guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is like try to get inside somebody's head by just watching them kind of do their thing or, or just absolutely. asking questions. A so, absolutely, absolutely. What can the data scientists do to help make their product manager more effective? So one thing definitely a product manager needs to know is to how to manipulate is how to manipulate data, right? Have a great understanding of uh, the databases, where does the data come from, and things like that. So have a high level of uh, capability to query data and uh, be able to integrate. Uh, that makes the life of data scientists very easy because uh, it will reduce the load of questions that uh, they will receive from a product manager, right? So uh, having a product manager who's uh, independently capable of querying data and making uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, decisions or making interpretations themselves or pulling insights themselves is a very helpful thing. So if a data scientist team can help product managers with that, uh, it would be a good thing. And on the flip side of the coin, how can data scientists learn product management skills? I, I can take an example uh, on me, for example, right? I'm on the business side. And one thing that I do to help data scientists' life a little bit better is to create uh, reposit repositories of business terms. Uh, you make huge repositories. For me, my repositories is based on regulatory uh, uh, language, um, safety language. You know, it's a lot of terms. Uh, there's a lot of classifications of products. Um, uh, all of these classifications speak to uh, some sort of, you know, our business performances. Uh, you know, having that repository allows data scientists to learn a little bit better about the business and what business leaders care about and what they need to focus on to uh, either increase the customer uh, uh, experience or um, increase the um, profit uh, for the business. I like that. Just like a keep like a almost like a dictionary for yourself that you can kind of refer to whenever whenever you need to. Oh, it's it's even even more than a dictionary. It's kind of like a repository you should have for any business use case that you have. That's so awesome. if if you're trying to build a classification tool for your products, uh, for you know to 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 expand uh, your business in different countries, then you need to have some sort of repository in terms of uh, you know business terms uh, that you can help the data scientists learn uh, to make sure. So. 
you, you can have another business use case that have a different type of kind of dictionary, just like you say. So it's kind of a living, uh, changing document that uh, uh, everybody can, can learn from. Thanks very much for that, man. I appreciate that. So I want to get into some of the really cool posts you do on LinkedIn. I think you have such insightful uh, content out there. I always learn something every time it pops up in my feed. And you posted something really insightful I liked um, recently uh, about the 10 dysfunctions of product management. So can you talk to us about a few of those that, uh, that really stick out to you? I guess the, the most dysfunctionate pieces of it. Uh, yeah, I, I do remember uh, uh, this, this post. Uh, I think when, when I was doing it, I, I liked it because I saw one that uh, uh, I'm seeing a lot of teams, including mine, uh, deal with. It's um, the obsession with uh, internal metrics, right? So we, we obsessed so much that we forget to keep an eye out on what really matters, Right. So, uh, and I can only speak to, to, to myself. We have, we each have a team of scientists or engineers, uh, business engineers who are able to, uh, pull data and put metrics together and things like that. But we become so proud when we finally create that pipeline, create that, uh, uh, you know, visualization, create those metrics, agree on this metric that, um, we continuously focus on changing it uh, or figure out how to make it better when we forget that, you know, uh, here we are building 100 metrics and only five of them really matter. So uh, to, to me, and, and I'm trying to pull it up here, I think it's called the counting hose. This one, oh my goodness, it doesn't matter. I've been to, for every single employer, I've seen this obsession where we, we put too many metrics at the, on the board and we forget each year when we prioritize which one should be discounted, which one should matter. <laughs> you end up with a dashboard that just has numbers everywhere and, and all these crazy graphs and stuff. So how can we, I guess, how do we make that determination then? Like if, if everybody wants to measure everything, how do we actually measure what really matters? Like how do we determine what matters? I think to me, it's more of a uh, group effort, but has to be led by uh, scientists who are able to design key uh, research, key testing, right? You have to test your audience. Uh, you have to test your customers. Uh, put a product out there and test it and gather the results and, and, and figure out what the customer uh, uh, cares about, right? So uh, if, if you run some tests, uh, you'll save yourself some times in terms of uh, what to focus on, right? So uh, if, if customers respond highly to a particular uh, uh, metric or a particular feature in your product, then build metrics around that feature so you can make sure that this feature continuously improves through iterations. So uh, uh, I think, you know, very robust testings uh, uh, can in, in testing result interpretation can help you get there. Yeah. That coupled, I think with like a little, little bit of not a little bit, but sharp clarity, just like actual clarity on what it is that you really care about. So of these dysfunctions that, that you, uh, that you posted about, which one do you see data scientists or data science teams potentially spinning their wheels around the most? Uh, I think they spin the wheel around, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to say metric uh, in terms of performance of their models. I've seen a lot of things there. Here's why. Um, when you don't invite the business stakeholders into your model building sessions, uh, you will miss out on capturing the level of risk that those business stakeholders are willing to take. So you build a model that is, you know, 94%, uh, you know, accurate. Is this what the business stakeholders are willing to accept? And then when it comes that time, business stakeholders say, wait a second, what does 94 mean for us? How does it affect our business? You know, what if 
you know, we're in the six, uh, you know, 6% in the wrong. And what impact does that have on my business? And when we have, you know, data science teams prop themselves into, you know, well, we increase the, you know, performance of that model by 2%. We we're at 92 or 94 now, where it's kind of like a, a battle, right? And you can avoid that by, again, pulling everybody together from the get-go. It all depends on the business case. What are we trying to solve and how much risk you're willing to take? Is 94% good? So for me, I can tell you in my world, I can say that I use you know, computer vision to take a look at uh, a product, right? Like the label of the product or the detail page of a product. If the computer vision space out, you know, uh, you know, an inference at 94% confidence level, am I comfortable with it? Yes or no? Just a quick example I can give you right? How does it impact me for, you know, these multiple instances, right? You have millions of products. If, you know, some of that fall in the 6%, what does that mean for the business? How much do I lose? And am I willing to take that risk? Thank you very much for that. And bring me to my next point, because you had another great post about the difference between AI and BI. Can you talk to us about what that difference is? So to me, BI is measuring, check-in measuring. Uh, somebody who's a good BI is able to communicate well, research well, interpret well, you know, in other words, query, understand the background, where the, does the data come from, and things like that. AI is more higher level. So BI can, used, can be used to test the efficiency or the effectiveness of AI implementation. So AI is more of a high level view. If you look at an organization as a whole and truncating it, truncating it to different, say, business processes and deciding which of these business processes can be automated and what are the tools, what are the systems uh, that you can build to automate. And when I mean automate, it's not necessarily replacing the human. It's more of a augmenting the human capabilities. So now, once you're done building that ecosystem of AI, which has so many components, you know, a lot of people think about robotics and things like that, but it's so much more than that. It's a whole ecosystem. When you take a look at that ecosystem, you can truncate it too and put some BI checks inside of it to make sure that it's effective throughout. And when you see the trends go in a direction you don't like, what are the things you can do to improve? So at the end of the day, it's when, when AI is applied for a business, it's because they want to do it more effectively, more efficiently. They want to save money. They want to optimize you know, user experience. They want to increase profits. That's it. And BI is there for the pulse. Check the pulse. And what makes for, I guess, what qualities do you think make for a good BI leader? Uh, I'm going to go with communication, uh, analytical skill, uh, and communication skills are probably the best. Uh, you could be the best person with, you know, who's able to query data and uh, perform some statistical analysis. But if you can't connect with your audience, um, you will have a hard time. So those are my top two qualities. And would it be the same qualities for an AI leader as well? Y yes but also who's able to step outside of you know their own world and see what's out there what are the outside trends and how do you stay ahead of that because ai today is seen as something that is just starting and, and only accelerating so a good a person that's good for ai is able to see future trends and is able to already think about the different things that he or she can do to implement it inside of the business or at least position the business in a way that will minimize impact and increase adoption. So you have to have that kind of foresight for it too. Um, so, and, and I'll give you a quick example. You implement a, an AI system, yes, you will eliminate certain jobs, but how many other jobs you will create with that? inside of your organization. You have to have some foresight for that. You have to have some good analysis for that, be able to, 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 to see it. 
Yeah, it's not like we're splitting up the same number of jobs that have been around since the Stone Age, right? The world is constantly changing and we constantly need people to do different tasks. And, you know, the jobs that my son, my son is six months old, like the jobs that he has available to him when he's my age, we're going to look back and be like, what? That's just, that's an insane role. Right? You know what I mean? So exactly. What can AI and BI people do to help make each other more effective? I think, I think it's more of a great collaboration, you know, and I, I did a post uh, on that too, AI versus BI. I really do think they, so to, to me, I think AI always needs BI to test and measure uh, its performance. I think that's the best way to, to go get a loan or go alone. Uh, and, you know, I don't think there can be AI without BI or vice versa. Um, you can't build a system without being able to test it and uh, perform some controls uh, in order for you to make an adjustment. And that's, that's what BI is for. So uh, I think they go in pair and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not a high effort at this point. Yeah. Thanks very much for that. I, I really appreciate that because I think some people, they, they hype up like being a data scientist, they hype up like, Oh, data science, machine learning, like this is all so great, but like data science itself, it, it's huge. And it includes like BI as well. And that's like a very important function, a very important role um, because that's essentially it's connecting the work you do back to the business so that you can measure and assess the impact that it's having on the business which ultimately determines whether you're going to have a job or not, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and let's not forget, AI is huge as well. You know, I'm sitting here saying AI, AI, but I must mention it's, it's huge too. What am I talking about here? Am I talking about, you know, just machine learning? Am I talking about robotics? You know, it, it, it depends what, what use case, what industry, right? There are so many industries uh, that look at AI through a different lens, mm -hmm. right? So if I look at where I am now with, uh, you know, Amazon, you know, is it in the world of natural language processing, you know, with what Alexa is doing, you know, to, ha to be able to have a, 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 a human conversation with Alexa, right? That's a different type of world. And then you go to the retail space or the, you know, fulfillment centers where you have robotics there that are helping humans be more efficient at their job so we can, you know, do business around the world. So that's a different world also that is the world of AI. So it's, it's vast. There's a lot to pick from. What do you think will be the biggest positive impact that AI will have in the next two to five years? on society? So I think that we, we, will, we will definitely be a little bit more efficient or faster at what we do. Um, I am looking forward to the next 10 years where we leverage it to help the environment a little bit more, right? So when we think about energy consumptions, when we think about water consumptions, you know, um, you're, we, there is no shortage of water there, if you think about it. No shortage of water. It's just that Earth is not transforming it fast enough, given the consumption rate that we're using water. So what, what can we use? How can we use AI to solve a lot of these problems and i hope that in the next 10 years we'll be able to make a bigger impact so because right now the hype is that it's just i'm a business i use ai and i do a good job at using ai to make more money they're not saying it but they're using it because they want to make more money you're here more because we want to create a good experience for the customer but at the end of the day they want to create value for their brand but uh, I am very excited to see businesses move. And they are, they are, right? You'll hear uh, sustainability commitment for, from a company like Amazon is taking, you know, there's a lot of AI behind that. 
uh, to make that such a huge commitment. And uh, that's what I'm excited about. How about the flip side of the coin? What do you think will be the scariest or most detrimental to society application of AI in the near future? The scariest for me is uh, fall under ethics, governance, uh, who has access, who has the right to data. Um, and also, given that, you know, businesses are, uh, you know, more, you know, multinational, international, uh, how do we create a platform to facilitate exchange of data across borders? And who's going to oversight that, right? And another thing, too, is, you know, third world countries, developing countries, they're so behind. You know, I think to me, AI is going to only accelerate advanced countries. And is that going to widen the gap between these advanced country countries and third world countries? So that's a huge concern I have. And, you know, the power is in the information. And uh, if you use a tool to augment how you use that information, that can be pretty scary. And that's where ethics uh, is a big thing. That's something I've been really, really curious about lately is, is ethics with respect to, to AI. What does that mean? What does that look like? I mean, we think about ethics and we think about it in terms of how we interact with fellow humans, right? And in our, you know, traditionally, at least in, in the in traditional sense of ethics. But now we're entering a world where we're interacting with systems. We might not be able to tell if there's a human on the other end of that chat bot. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, or, or yeah, it's really, really fascinating to me, really interesting and something that, you know, I, I hope to learn more about. But I'm curious, have you done any thinking into to how, what kind of code of ethics we should have as practitioners of machine learning and AI? Have you explored anything like that? Or can you share some of your thoughts around that? I haven't explored much, but I've thought about it for sure. And to me, it starts with a simple thing, which is uh, transparency, right? Mm -hmm. Let's not forget, it's not a one-way street. If we take a look at a company like Google, Facebook, whatever, users are willingly creating their accounts. So they're even whether we can discuss, we can, you know, could be a, this, another discussion, whether they read the, the terms and conditions or not, they're willingly creating their accounts. Therefore, given companies like Facebook access to their data, but the transparency piece is what can take it to the next level. It's kind of like, how do we create a platform where we make that user safe by letting him know, hey, here's what I have in terms of your data, here's what I'm doing with it, or do you allow me to do X, Y, Z kind of thing. You know, transparency can create trust, and, um, and to me, transparency too can help the user understand the value of the data they are generating on a daily basis at every second. So um, to me, it starts there, and... Yeah. Who pushes that transparency, though? That's another discussion as well. Yeah. Because, you know, you're talking about the government has to take, you know, a well, step I mean, in. You think about it, like, companies have internal audit, right? For their accounting practices or even their IT practices. There's IT audit. There's audit for finance and accounting. Is there audit now for machine learning or AI systems? And should there be, right? Like, should the companies hire an external third party, you know, auditing company to talk, quote unquote, audit their algorithms, audit their books, right? What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, so I think it's coming up, right? Um, you know, global data governance is, is a huge uh, discussion uh, around the world today. And I think uh, we will not be short of organizations or third party organizations, whether they're affiliated with government, local government or not, they'll be able to make that assessment. Um, are big companies ready for that today? I don't think so. Again, this is a simple opinion. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, are they ready to open up the books and show these third parties what they've been doing with data? I don't know. I don't think so. But we're going there uh, for sure. Uh, if you think about something like autonomous vehicle, 
I've been thinking about it and I read about it too, when you have an autonomous vehicle uh, get involved in, in an accident and the autonomous vehicle is responsible because the autonomous vehicle took the wrong turn and turned onto uh, foot traffic and uh, killed someone. So who's responsible? Certainly you can't punish the autonomous vehicle. Do you punish the creators? You know, who knows? And how does that look like in a different culture, right? Different culture that has got, that gives value to different things. How does that look like? Look like? Does government need to step in, et cetera, et cetera? So uh, with that, I don't think we'll be short of third party organizations or government organizations will be there to kind of uh, lead the way there. At least that's what I think. Is this kind of related to this concept of compliance as a service? I know that that's something that you've got a little bit of, uh, or quite a lot of bit of expertise on. Um, can you talk to us about that? Yeah. So compliance as a service, uh, it's creating, simply creating the ecosystem for, you know, being, you know, having a green card to do business, right? And, and I'm trying my best to, to not use weird terms. Building that ecosystem means you have a set of, of technology, softwares, whether it's softwares or processes, workflows, right, the right teams for, to allow any products that you create to get, to allow that product to obtain a green card to do business in any country. And that green card, you have to have, you, you have to meet a lot of requirements, right? Uh, whether it's a safety requirement, if it's a product you're selling for kids, on the uh, product's tag, you have to put a claim, right, on how to use that product, something like that. That's a safety claim. Um, if it's an import requirement, you have to have certain paperwork. You have to show that you've done your testings, you stored your results, you, are, you know how to trace it back to the last production lot. All of these things is that whole ecosystem that gives that product the green card to do business in at the territory of concern is what I call compliance as a service. So anything that enables that product to go on the market as fast as possible. Do, do you think data scientists need to know anything about compliance? And if so, how do we, how do we go about upping our knowledge in that respect? Absolutely. I think they, they are aware of these things already. And, uh, you know, we're not shy of problems uh, that requires them to help us. And I, I mentioned one earlier, classification is one of them. How do you classify your products as fast as possible? Um, you know, a companies as huge as Amazon, you could, you can imagine that the, the labels are huge. The number of labels are huge. And how do you come up with the best classification? Now on the legal side, there's, there's a lot of legal language too, when it comes to compliance. Uh, what, what is the best tool to, uh, accommodate that? So if you think about it, we're very lucky to be part of Amazon because, you know, you have AWS creating these great tools that allow us to uh, leverage for our business use cases. So if you think about Textract for text extraction uh, in Amazon Comprehend for, uh, to add context to, to the text so we can perform some business decisions. And uh, we already have tools there that, that can help us. Right on, man. Thank you very much for that. I really enjoyed that, that bit there. Um, give me a lot to think about now. I've got the wheels turning all about ethics and compliance, and I'm definitely going to dig a little bit more into that um, for, for my next kind of bit of research. So Absolutely. Kind of changing gears a little bit here. So there's always that, that saying, ship before it's ready, right? Ship it before you're ready. And I think that, totally makes sense in like the software development space, but I feel like people need to do that with their careers, right? They need to just ship it. And I think people get scared to do that because of the crazy job descriptions that are out there <laughs> for data science roles. So what advice or insight do you have or that you can share with people who are breaking into the field? They look at these job postings, some of them, they want the entire, you know, abilities of an entire team wrapped up into one person. They feel like, you know, just dejected, 
discouraged yeah. from it, 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 you, you you nailed it there man it is that the term ship before ready uh definitely should be applied to all of us whether you want to be in the realm of data science or not uh you have to be able to take a look at a job description and see if you can fit it at 50 to 70 percent and um and you can increase that percentage by working on a project uh a good a person who's good at applying is able to anticipate the problems of the hirer and showcase their projects to you know to show alignment with that anticipated problem that the hire is having, right? You take a look at a job description, typically they tell you why they hire, they want to hire you. So you have to do the job in terms of picturing or researching what kind of problems that they must be going through right now and what kind of projects have I worked on that is similar to the potential problems they might be having right now. And how do I position myself to ship it before it's ready? I love that, man, because it's just you have to think from the perspective of the company, and the hiring manager, right? Like, what do, you, what do you think they actually are looking to get accomplished in this role? Like they might have a list of whatever qualifications are looking for, but you don't look at that list of qualifications. You look at the job description and you look at how potentially your skills can help solve the problems that they're describing that job description. Absolutely. That's it. That's it. You lose, you lose everything if you don't try. Exactly, right? Like, what's the worst that can happen? Like, okay, you cannot apply for the job and not get the job and not hear back, which is literally the exact same result that would happen if you were to apply for the job and they didn't reach out. I guess I said that backwards. So let me, I'm going to yep. fix, I'm going to fix this on the editing, <laughs> but, <laughs> but like you can apply for the job and not hear back, right? Or you yeah. could not apply for the job and not hear back. Either yeah. way, the result is the same. So why not just go and go for it and apply for the go job? Go for it. Exactly. And let's not forget, you know, the hirer, if he's a scientist or she's a scientist, is able to take a look at the technical terms that you'll put in your, you know, your resume, but be also open to, you know, writing it in at the most layman term as possible to increase the audience who's going to read your, your resume. Nowadays, you know, companies uh, get more than just the hire, hiring manager to interview you. So if somebody on the business side is reading your resume, is that person able to understand that the projects you worked on correlate to or is similar or similar to the issues that he or she's having? So thank you very much for that, man. I mean, I hope people at home are listening and, and just, really just take the step, man. Just, I, I know so many people message me as part of my mentee community. Like oh, I'm so scared of everybody else's skills. I'm so scared of all these job postings. And it's like, nah, dude, you don't have to be just, just go for it. And then, and, and what's the worst that could happen? You don't hear back. Okay. Well, worst things have happened to people. So there's a, a interesting post that actually I saw you post um right before we had jumped onto this call. Um, I wanted to, to, to have you kind of unpack that for us, this concept of first order and second order thinking. I'm yeah. like, that was really fascinating, man. Do you mind talking to us about that? Absolutely. First of all, I need to give full, full, full credit to uh, Denny uh, Sheridan, who created Facts of the Day One. I believe a couple months or under a year into joining Amazon, he created this where a lot of people now tuning are tuning into it and uh, it, it even has a LinkedIn page and I get uh, daily emails from facts of the day one and uh, I learn tons and you know, I love sharing with my audience what I've learned. So uh, this is where I've pulled it. Uh, but first principle thinking uh, the first time I be, I'll be frank, I've learned from it is hearing, Elon Musk uh, talk about it uh, is being able to break down an issue to down to the f fundamental truth uh, that no one in a room of experts can change, right? But if we think about it in terms of, I want to become a data scientist. Well, what does that mean? You have to take a look at that goal as a tree with branches, big and small, in leaves, those 
the truck is the base that you need to know to become a data scientist. Then you have the big branches and then the leaves is kind of like, where do you want to be in the data scientists, data science ecosystem? Do you want to be a data engineer? We're deep dive into that, go into the leaves, study it, learn from it. Then when you're done with that, um, you practice it because we tend to forget. We retain, but we forget over time. So practicing what you learn will cement, you know, your expertise. That's first principles thinking. Then second order thinking is a different thing. So I'm going to use a different use case than I want to become a data scientist. It's kind of like, just like the post, it's such a great example. I will create autonomous vehicles that run on batteries. So second order thinking is simply asking yourself in your group, asking themselves, what is the impact of that, right? What does that mean for gas companies? What does that mean for energy consumptions? You know, what does that mean for convenience stores at the gas station? You know, all of these things and start thinking down these levels, you know, peeling that onion to figure out whether the new solution you're implemented doesn't have very impactful, you know, effects downstream that could be even hurtful to the economy or overall balance it out or even make it better. So you have to be able to uh, get that second order thinking going uh, once you create a solution. Thanks for that, man. I'm definitely going to follow them and get some of those emails as well. Uh, That's really, I've actually seen you post a a few shares from that fact of the day one, and it's always amazing stuff, man. Uh, So definitely, definitely going to, I'll post that uh, into the show notes as well. So we're talking a bit about, I guess, non-technical skills that a data scientist needs. So you mentioned communication uh, being one of them. What, I guess, what is the importance of communication and how can a data scientist build a strong set of communication skills? I think to me, the first thing is to be able to practice um, empathy, right? So a data scientist will have, is somebody who solves a problem or comes up with a solution for a customer, right? And being able to empathize is a clear sign of emotional intelligence and being able to, uh, you know, put yourself at the, you know, customer's shoes to fully understand what they're going through. Uh, And this is how you can relate. So once you're able to put yourself at at their shoes, on their shoes or in their shoes, you can express a clear message that elaborate how you will solve the problem. So long story short, empathy, start with empathy. Absolutely, man. That's like the most important skill, I think. Um, I was, I'm actually writing a, a piece. Uh, it's on persuasion, and it's a EPIC framework for persuasion, E-P-I-C. That's empathy, nice. perspective-taking, influence, and concurrence, right? And it all starts with empathy. If you want to persuade, come I mean, think about it, man. You're a data scientist. You might think you're a scientist, but you are in the business of sales. You are moving people. You are moving people to part with resources, part with time, part with their old ways so that they can adopt your new methodology. You are in sales. You're not selling individual products. You're not cold calling people, but you are selling your ideas. And And you're selling emotions. That's right. Yeah. And it all starts with that, that first part of the framework, the empathy. That's it understanding what somebody is thinking. Once you can understand what they're thinking, then, I mean, sorry, understand what they're feeling. Once you understand what they're feeling, you can understand what they're thinking, right? Mm -hmm. That's it. We're emotional creatures, right? Human beings are driven by emotions as much as we try as data scientists to train the emotion out of us with all this rational, logical thinking that we do. We cannot escape this basic fact of human nature. Exactly. Do you have tips for data scientists when they're in a room full of executives and they're trying to communicate and sell their ideas to a non-technical audience? What can we do to make sure that 
we're selling our idea in such a way that it has the best chance of being bought? I think uh, the best thing is to always leave the door open for that business stakeholder who's often the decision, the decision maker, uh, leave the door open to, to interpret a different thing, a different ways. So provide kind of like in a room full of business stakeholders, always provide a list of prescriptions and those prescriptions needs to clearly elaborate the business scenarios or business outcomes. Always do that. If you do X, X, Y, Z will happen. If you do Y, A, B, C will happen with a chance of Z, something like that. Always leave that list of prescriptions. And that list of prescriptions needs to be clearly communicated, time bound, data sound, and speaks to the business processes that they, those business stakeholders are fully aware of. So, Greg, last formal question here before we jump into a random round. It is 100 years in the future. It is the year 2120. What do you want to be remembered for? <sighs> Frankly, I want to be remembered as one who helped with the next frontier of data management out of space. I like that. Elaborate on that a little bit more. That, that's... It's kind of like um, we have a lot of the data centers here on Earth, uh, whether we shoot probes in the universe and we wait years for that probe to send back messages or data, we store that data on Earth. Mm. Why can't we store data centers on other planets? I think it's already happening too. Uh, I want to be one who help with that. It's crazy, but can you That's imagine cool, data man. centers? Uh, not until this very moment had I imagined that putting we can put data centers on the moon. That is, that's that's a bit of your uh, your your sci-fi writing roots <laughs> coming out, huh? That's pretty cool, man. That's it. That's it. That's really cool, man. That is, uh, that's that. That's, I like that. Man, that's very now, profound. Yeah, yeah. With, with all of these billions of planets, think about how much data we can harvest um, and store and learn from. So for me, the next hundred years is really looking at how is the internet going to help us there? What, what's next after the internet, right? Hmm. How do we how do we transfer data faster and more secure? I've read a couple of things about quantum computing and how it will create a safer way or and faster way to transmit billions of uh, you know data in a split second. You know, I'm I'm really curious about that. The world of quantum computing and. Uh, Definitely, I want to be remembered for the work being done as a contributor for uh, the next level be on Earth and, and whatever we do to protect Earth. That's awesome, man. Absolutely love that. So let's jump into a random round here. So you get a chance to start all over. You can pursue your dream of being a sci-fi writer. What would your script be about? Uh, it's probably going to be about... Of course, I'm gonna use a corny word. Uh, it's us discovering that the aliens of the future trying to teach us something is actually us in the future kind of thing. Oh, like Incep not, not Inception, what's that movie called? Uh, oh my God, with Matthew McConaughey. Well, Interstellar. Interstellar, Interstellar yeah, that, that kind of thing. Ka kind of, kind of thing, I that kind of thing. I, I, I like those types of, of stories. And now what that lesson would be, I don't know. I would have to think about it and, and come up with an original story, but that's what the premises would be. I like that, man. I think I might watch Interstellar tonight. <laughs> what are you currently most excited about or currently exploring? A couple of things, right? So uh, quantum computing, definitely. I want to start learning or reading and reading more about that. Uh, excited about that. Uh, from a employment perspective, I want to become a product manager 
and I want to, at Amazon, of course, and I want to manage a, an ecosystem of artificial intelligence products. I, um, I've spoken about that um, with my peers and I'm, um, you know, positioning myself for one day I become a product manager in that sense. And uh, another thing I'm excited about is I'm also working on entrepreneurship. Uh, so I have other partners. I do have a, an integrated marketing company. Uh, you know, I've been in entrepreneurship since I was in college. Uh, I've stopped and started again. And hopefully one day I'll be able to not only be brave enough, but have enough resources and enough knowledge, um, but mostly courage to, to start my own company. And I'm, and I'm really excited about that. I look forward to seeing that happen for you, man. That's awesome. Thank you. If you could have a billboard placed anywhere in the world, what would you put on it? Where would you put it? So, so the, the message is one of my favorite. Let curiosity be your driver for growth. And I would probably put it is going to be huge. I would, you said it, it doesn't have to be on earth. Anywhere you want it to be. Anywhere I would put it on the moon. <laughs> put it on the moon. And then on the full moon, you see it against the full moon. The color is against the full moon, so you can see it clearly. I love it. Right man. there. What are you currently reading? Uh, so I, I read a lot of articles uh, that I found everywhere. And uh, believe me or not, um, uh, LinkedIn is a huge source for that. There are so many content creators that I have a solid pipeline of articles that keep coming, right? So I have a lot of articles that I read it, uh, just about every day. Uh, and I, I'm ashamed, but I just started with Audibles. And my first book is Zero to One. And after that, I'm going to read The Lean Startup and then a couple books about AI. I'm not a reader, uh, so I'm more comfortable with Audibles. But if it's an article, I'll read it and read it again, but I am not a book reader at all. Audible is awesome. I've, uh, I, I live by Audible. I, I go through books a week, like multiple a week. So since you just started zero to one, let me ask you this question. Uh -huh. what, what do you believe that other people think is crazy? I think, I believe that we will be a multi-planetary species. I think a lot of people think it's crazy or, or not necessarily they think it's crazy, but they think they, don't, they just don't think about it. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that we will continue to be efficient at transportation because in order to be a multi-planetary species, you have to be able to transport certain things that we built here over there so we can start harvesting the local resources and continue building. I love it, man. No, that's, that's, I, I, I hope we get to see something interesting like that happen in our lifetime. At the very least, I hope we find life on another planet in our lifetime. I don't even care if it's just like an insect. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It, if you think about it, it's, it's coming down to the same thing, man. It's energy consumption. How do we minimize energy consumption to get us from point A to point B? Mm -hmm. Right. When you look at the the race going on right now between the space companies, it's all about recycling the tools and equipments to make it more affordable, to make transportation more affordable. So once that's more affordable, just like, you know, I've heard Jeff Bezos say, you know, what else, what other technology can we build on top of that? Once you make energy consumption more affordable and less costly in terms of long travel, long distance traveling. Who, who's the next level of scientist who will start building on that? That's cool, man. That's awesome thing to think about, man. So when do you think the first video on YouTube to hit 1 trillion views will happen? And what do you think that video will be about? Interesting question. So 1 trillion view, I just want to clarify that a little bit. So when you say 1 trillion view, um, obviously you want me to watch it 10 times and that counts as 10 views, right? 
No, no, just like for for example, like right, right, right now, I think the most highest view, like the the video with the most views on YouTube is like something like seven or eight billion views, and it's yeah, it's twenty twenty right now. So when when will that video that that gets one trillion views, like when will that happen? <laughs> Ooh, that's a that's a hefty number, and we definitely need more population for that. Uh, we have 7 billion views now with a YouTube video and, and video I'm just estimating des- 7 billion, right? S- about 7, 8 billion and it is Despacito. Despacito got 7, 8 billion, right? And I know for a fact that we're only about 54% with people with internet access. So add another 54% to that, that only puts us, oh man, we're... Okay, uh, just shooting a number here. We're so far from this. I'm going to say we're looking at probably 20, 30 for this. It's going to take time. You need, you need more population and you need more access to internet, uh, uh, faster broadcasting and things like that. So uh, that's, that's my... Uh, and what it will be about, it will be... <laughs> I don't want to go about on something. Uh, we 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 are emotional people, man. So it's kind of it's kind of hard. Um, it's probably going to be about some sort of kid prodigy that is explaining a scientific demonstration, giving a scientific demonstration. Probably a kid under under eighteen. So I would say between ten and eighteen, explaining something. Baby son, if you're listening to this in the future, that better be you. (laughs) So what would you do if you're the last person on earth? I'd definitely go straight to the books to understand what can I do about agriculture? Mm -hmm. Because I think agriculture can not only help me survive, but also help earth as well. Right. So earth can have pity on me. All right, we're going to take this one to the random question generator here. We'll do a couple out of this one. <laughs> what do you do on a free afternoon in the middle of the week? Or what would you do? Um, I have a lot of uh, classes that I follow, whether it's on LinkedIn or uh, Udemy. Uh, I typically allocate 30 minutes per classes. Um, and... I dwell on it. Um, Amazon has a huge uh, repository of resources too. So I'm taking like uh, classes on product management as well. So any afternoon that I'm free during the week, I'm there uh, making myself better. Yeah, man. I mean, it's, it's so many, so many interesting things to learn. And it's a shame that we only have one lifetime. You know what Absolutely, I mean? Man. And and only twenty four hours in the day, and we have to sleep. Like life, <laughs> like there's so much interesting things to learn, man. So many and there are so many things. people who are doing so much that I, I I really wonder, like, how do you do it? Are you sure you have twenty four hours per day? Because it feels like what you're doing is worth thirty per day. Yeah, yeah. No, I definitely definitely share that sentiment. What is one of your favorite smells? Hmm. One of my favorite smells. Fried eggs in the morning. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm a breakfast guy too. Oh yeah. I am too, man. Um, and I, I, I'm a huge fan of eggs, um, eggs and pancakes. My goodness. Shit, yes, man. please. My favorite smell is actually pancakes. Like, yeah. yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. That those two, man, it's mm, yes, please. What story does your family always tell about you? Ah. Uh, Kind of like two things. Uh, I had a little bit of sneakiness to me when I was little and also clumsiness too. Uh, I'm typically the guy who, instead of running when, you know, disaster is about to happen, I stay and kind of observe, look around and hurt myself at some point. So uh, they, they will not forget those stories and always hunt me with them. Last one out of the question generator here. Who are some of your heroes? Some of my heroes, uh, I'm going to start with definitely my 
my parents for sure. Um, my brothers, because they did achieve a lot. Um, and I would say the people who inspire me on LinkedIn, I have a handful that I will consume their uh, materials on a daily basis. And I just have complete admiration for how strong they are, how persistent they are uh, in terms of moving the needle and producing and uh, helping society. And I, I, I really like that. Greg, how can people connect with you? Where can they find you online? Uh, definitely on LinkedIn. Uh, the, so you do, you do the slash Greg slash Coquillo on LinkedIn, you will find me. And uh, Coquillo is G uh, C O Q U I L L O. Uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm uh, pretty open. I do have a backlog on my LinkedIn messages, uh, but I make an effort um, at the end of the day or uh, during the weekend to take a look at it and respond to messages. Um, I'll continue to produce, share, learn with you all. And uh, I'm very open there. So hopefully in the future, I'll also start being more active um, in other channels like Twitter or um, Instagram. But for now, uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'll definitely put a link to the show notes so that people can can follow you. Greg, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be on the show today. I really, really appreciate having you here. Harper, this was, it was my pleasure uh, and honor. Uh, I thank you again, and I hope that uh, uh, it was fruitful to you uh, as it was fruitful, fruitful to me. And uh, looking forward to doing it again. And I hope you have a great uh, rest of your weekend. And I say hi also to the audience. And I hope uh, you guys have a blessed day.